wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd habita fillah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh continuing on in our study of Bulugh Amaram we reach the 917th hadith in Kitab Al-Nikah, the book of uh, Nikah or marriage and the chapter of Talaq, which is chapter 7, narrated Ibn Abbasin radiallahu ta'ala anhuma in the name of Allah's Messenger, uh, in the time of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and the first two years of the Khalifat of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the three pronouncements of divorce were regarded as one divorce. So Umar said, people have made haste in an affair which they are required to take slowly. What if we execute it on them? So he executed it on them, reported by Muslim. In this hadith in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Ibn Abbas and radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, we learned that in the time of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr, in the first two years of the Khalifat of Umar Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu, that the three pronouncements of divorce were only considered a one divorce. And what this means, so that way we have clarity in regards to this hukum, in regards to the background of this hadith, we need to understand that what has been practiced is that some of the Muslims practice that pronouncing uh, divorce over one's wife, say if a husband and wife, they've been married, and the husband pronounces three divorces at one time. So some of the people and some of the scholars hold <coughs> hold that this divorce is the irrevocable talaq or the irrevocable divorce meaning that uh, talaq ba'in that they are no longer uh, married that she is in her she would be in her final idda but however as as uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated that during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, his sunnah, and that of uh, Abu Bakr, what he practiced, and Omar, during the first two years of his Khalifat, was that uh, the pronouncements of talaq, uh, you know, that you cannot pronounce the final talaq and divorce your wife all at one time. Meaning that the pronouncement, even if you pronounce it 20 times, it only counts as one divorce, meaning at the the time of pronouncement. That when you pronounce the divorce, then she is now in her idda, and then you would have to wait till the finishing of her idda, and then pronounce another talaq, if that were the case, if there was even a need for this and it's a bit difficult to understand and see a situation in which that would uh, be the case. So in regards to this hadith, we learn that the legal statuses of three divorces given at one time. What is the hukum regarding this? There is a different opinion, a difference of opinion on this issue amongst the scholars. One of the view is that the three divorces given together at a time are nothing and have no legal status at all. So for a group of the scholars, they don't hold that it is a valid divorce at all, that it's not even a valid divorce, that this is a bid'ah, and this is totally rejected, and not even talaq. The second opinion is that three divorces given together at a time are counted and the woman is divorced. The third opinion is that 
this is only one divorce. So meaning that second view is that the it's the irrevocable uh, talaq and they are no longer married at all. There's no uh, way for them to come back except after she has married a new husband. He has entered in uh, her. They've had sexual relations and then they divorce. And after her inda, then she can make a new nikah with her prior husband. So that's that will be the hukum in that in that situation. Uh, and as we said, the third uh, opinion is that this is only one divorce; that it is only counted as one talaq, even if they pronounce it three times. The fourth opinion is that if the woman has carried out the sexual intercourse, then all three will count. And if she has not carried out sexual intercourse, then only one will happen. Among these different views, the third view, as we mentioned, is the strongest and the more reasonable and most acceptable. And what the evidences show is the strongest of evidences. As we see from this very hadith, <laughs> that most importantly that this is uh, what was practiced, the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. After that, there really doesn't need to be a lot of in-depth discussion because that is la shak, that's the strongest evidence uh, to, to go back to. And then this was also the case during the time of Abu Bakr and even Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, practiced this during the first two years of his khalifat and then as going back to the hadith, he said, so Umar said, people have made haste in an affair which they are required to take slowly. Meaning that the divorce and the reason for that idda, for the, the waiting period, is to make sure the woman is not pregnant and also to give the husband and wife a chance to, uh, to, to reconcile their differences and bring their family back together. So Omar who said that people have made haste in an affair which they are required to take slowly. What if we execute it on them? So he executed it on them, meaning he implemented it on them. So this is where those other ahkam uh, were, some of the other ahkam were derived from this pronouncement of Omar and implementing that. Some of the benefits of this hadith one of the important uh, benefits that we derive from this hadith is that the divorce when it's pronounced three times that it does happen. So this is in contrast to the scholars who have that first uh, view that it is not even a divorce at all. But rather, even a man, if he pronounces divorce three times on his wife, he says, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, or however he, he uh, does this, that it is only considered one divorce, one talaq. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is uh, that the divorce doing so, that this is only counted as one. And how are these different uh, benefits? Because the first benefit is showing us that divorce does take place. And that's a refutation of the scholars who have the first view. And the second benefit is that not only does it take place, but that it is considered one. It's considered, and that's a refutation of the other uh, statements of the scholars who hold uh, those other views. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that uh, divorce is a very serious affair as we mentioned that uh, marriage and divorce are very serious and that these issues should not be rushed. Rushed into a marriage without uh, you know, taking the, the necessary precautions and using wisdom 
in uh, choosing a, a spouse or a partner and likewise rushing to divorce. So this is very, very important. And this is why uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Ista'ajilu fi, fi amrin kanat lahum fihi ana'at. Uh, ana'a. So Umar said uh, that they, uh, the people have made haste in an affair in which we used to take slowly or which was taken slowly, meaning that it was exercised with caution. It wasn't rushed into divorce every time there's some minor dispute or even sometimes if it's a major dispute that not rushing into uh, seeking divorce, seeking the khula, seeking to separate the family, and especially so when there are children involved. So this is very important, and those are important benefits that we gain from this hadith. In the next hadith, narrated Mahmud ibn Labid, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was informed about a man who had divorce his wife with all three pronouncements, he stood up in anger and said, Is Allah's book being played with while I am amongst you? As a result, a man got up and said, O Allah's messenger, shall I kill him? Reported by a Nisa'i, its narrators are reliable, thiqa. In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this hadith uh, clarifies for us the importance of taking this affair of divorce as something very seriously, that it's something not to be taken lightly. And likewise, this hadith shows us that the divorce uh, does not count as three divorce uh, when being pronounced at once and that the Prophet Sallallahu he made strong inkar or he uh, was very displeased and rejected that in a stern uh, fashion. So from this hadith, some of the benefits of this hadith is first it shows the permissibility of rejecting uh, a munkar or a sin or something which is incorrect openly in order to clarify the ruling. And this is because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Uh, made inkar of that man's uh, action openly, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it shows us that the Prophet sallallahu was not going to be silent about a munkar that was being openly committed and becoming uh, what what he he viewed could have become widespread. Instead, he put an end to that and. Uh, and, and made inkar of it. Another benefit of this hadith is this had, hadith also illustrates for us the impermissibility that it is haram to divorce uh, three times in one sitting. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Ayil Abu Bi Kitabi La Ta'ala the Prophet ﷺ said, Are you, you know, making fun or playing with the book of Allah, the Almighty? And I am amongst you? So it's like you're, you know, disrespecting the Prophet ﷺ and thinking you could get away with something like this, something as serious as this by playing with the book of Allah. So this is a very serious type of inkar. And that's why the man got up who, who was like, you know, ready to have the person's head. Shall I go kill him? You know, is this that serious message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And of course the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not have him 
uh, do such a thing. Uh, also, we learn from that statement uh, that the scholars, they agree that it's permissible uh, the, the opposite, which is to divorce a woman, uh, you know, one time, of course, in one sitting, and that this is the talaq a sunnah. This is the talaq sunnah. And we already talked about a talaq bid'i in the first hadith that we studied uh, in the last lesson with regards to uh, a talaq bid'i being the innovated talaq when a person uh, divorces a woman during her menses or divorces a woman uh, after have having after having had sexual relations with her, that this those are known as talaq bid'i, and we also discussed whether it happens or whether it does not happen. So this hadith also makes clear for us what is the sunnah with regards to this, and that it is impermissible to divorce a woman more than once in uh, in a single sitting. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it is uh, permissible to become angry and express emotion during uh, uh, not just admonishment but in one's preaching in one's preaching so it could be in the sense of the khutbah or it could be in giving a lecture or whatever the case may be that this is something permissible and this is what we see the Prophet ﷺ sometimes raised his voice and sometimes expressed anger uh, as in this hadith in which he was upset that someone would be think of even playing and likened it to playing with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and playing, playing around with the ahkam uh, of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala especially in the presence of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, something that must be noted that this is mushtarat, that there's a condition that this anger is not out of control. You know, severe anger to the extent that a person is out of control in the sense that a person is uh, being, getting involved in, uh, you know, being in haram, for example, fighting, uh, cursing, being uh, wild, or whatever the case may be, but rather this is a controlled anger. It's still, anger has different levels. And it has different levels in the shara, as far as the hukum. And as we mentioned prior to this also, prior to this hadith, that uh, when uh, divorcing out of anger, does this happen or not? The scholars differ over this, and the most correct view is that if the uh, if the person reaches a level of anger, so letting us know that that the Sharia recognizes that there's different levels of anger, but if the person reaches a level of anger in decreeing talaq, in which their intellect is no longer present, then this uh, that level is considered is not considered a talaq. That means the person was they reached a level of anger that they were unaware of what they were doing. But if it's less than that, then the scholars say that uh, the uh, talaq has happened. So letting us know that anger, uh, you know, has Sharia implications uh, when when it comes to and is considered when giving rulings in the Sharia. Another benefit of this hadith. is this hadith also shows us uh, that it is permissible and preferable in some cases, not in all cases, to openly uh, reject a, a sin or a munkar uh, immediately without delaying it. So again, this requires uh, a hikmah, wisdom, on when it's better, the, looking at the maslaha, the benefits, wa mafsada, and the harms in the issue on how to apply, 
how to reject the munkar and in which way to reject the munkar. For example, if it's going to be a greater munkar by uh, rejecting it immediately, maybe there's in, in the presence of people of status and this particular individual, it's better out of patience to show for the sake of dawah or whatever the case may be to not make that in, that uh, ankar at that moment. However, other times it may be more applicable that this uh, mistake is not spread. So this hadith shows us that it is uh, that at times it is better and preferable and per perhaps can even be an obligation to reject the munkar openly, immediately. So it just depends upon the uh, the the situation. Uh, and, and an example which will show the opposite hukum, to, so that way we're we're clear about this that there is times when it is better preferable to delay, when there's more maslaha to delay that, is the hadith when the Arabi, the Bedouin, he came in the masjid of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi he came in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid, the masjid uh, uh, Nabawi in Medina. And he came in there and he urinated in the masjid, in the corner of the, in the masjid. We can't even imagine that now. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Da'ahu. Uh, and then he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, mentioned when the man was through, he admonished him. He didn't just immediately say, get him or stop him. But there are many, there's so much fiqh in that hadith. As we mentioned when we were studying the book of Tahara, there's so much fiqh in that hadith showing us that there are sometimes it's better to delay uh, the uh, rejecting the munkar. And this was for a couple of reasons, just two reasons. One reason, the harm it would have came, it would have befallen that individual, that that uh, Bedouin, if he would have, if they would have stopped him immediately, then it might have caused him physical harm, or whatever the case may be. And secondly, it may have caused him to spread the urine around the masjid even more, by trying to uh, hold and control himself or the people jumping him, and perhaps it could have sprayed urine on them, akramakum Allah. So it shows that there's immense wisdom, and this comes from fiqh fideen. May yirad Allah bi khayran yafaqo fideen. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives him understanding of the religion. So this fiqh fideen shows us sometimes when it is more applicable to uh, command the good and forbid the evil immediately, and then sometimes it may be better to postpone it and to do it behind closed doors. Like for an example, another case scenario would be with, with dealing with the leaders, that you would not jump on the mimbar and start publicizing the leader's sin, sins. Even if it's, it's open sins, that this is not the place because this can cause in the hearts of the people for them to detest the leadership or maybe rebel against the leaders or it leads to all kind of mufasid. And the mufasid, the harms, become greater than the benefit of rejecting that munkar. So instead, the more appropriate way would be, in accordance with the, the salaf, is to, behind closed doors, uh, you know, through writing, and, and, and through those people who have uh, ties and status, for example, the major scholars, uh, perhaps in many of the societies that they have a status with the, the leadership. So then they're able to, uh, behind closed doors, to write, to speak to the leader during meetings, or whatever the case may be, and uh, reject that munkar and express displeasure with that munkar, with that sin. So it shows us again, this hadith illustrates for us, that it requires fiqh, and that sometimes that it is better to reject the munkar or the sinfulness outright like the Prophet Sallallahu did in this hadith.
Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it also shows that there is a strong admonishment for the one who attempts to divorce his wife three times in one sitting. That this, this uh, irrevocable uh, divorce is strongly rejected and the Prophet ﷺ made strong inkar of that. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates the ghira or the jealousy and love for the Sharia and for the Prophet wasallam that the Sahaba had. Because when they observed that the Prophet wasallam was angry uh, about this, this news that this man was trying to make, uh, to divorce uh, three times in one sitting, the Prophet wasallam became very angry and they, in turn, you know, out of their love for the Prophet ﷺ and, and wish to not see him anger, angry, and wish and desire to not see people transgress the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book, the Kitab Allah, that they, uh, they had ghira, they had a jealousy in their religion. And this, unfortunately, is lost amongst many of us because of our weakness in Iman and weakness in understanding the religion. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that this munkar does not make it permissible to shed blood. And we know this because the man got up and he wanted to have, uh, to, to, he asked the Prophet ﷺ permission to kill the person who did this. Out of ghira, but this is how they understood it. And they were very strong uh, in practicing their religion. Also the context at the time uh, was very... Uh, you know, much more uh, harsher life and, and, and way of dealing with things. So this Sahabi, Jalil, he wanted to deal with this issue, like, Ya Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, should I go have this man's head? Should I go take care of this? And in this, this munkar, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not give him permission to do that. So it shows the ghira of the Prophet, uh, of the, the Sahaba, and likewise, it shows that this sin is not something that you spill blood and, and you execute uh, uh, behind this ordeal. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us that the Quran is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's what the, and the, the kalam of Allah because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used the actual statement. He said, uh, you know, bi uh, kitab illah, you know, uh, you know, basically, are you playing with the book of Allah? You know, while I'm amongst you, you're playing with the book of Allah. So what did the Prophet ﷺ say? The book of Allah, letting us know the Quran is what? It's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is what? It is the kalam of Allah. It is the uncreated speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. Those are just some of the benefits from the many benefits of that hadith. In the next hadith, the 919th hadith, narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abu Rakana divorced Um Rakana. So Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, Take your wife back. And he replied, I have divorced her with three pronouncements. He said, I have understood, take her back, reported by Abu Dawood. A wording by Ahmed has Abu Rakana divorced his wife with three pronouncements in one sitting. Then he was grieved about her, and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him, "They, meaning the three pronouncements, uh, are reckoned as a single utterance uh, of divorce." The two ahadith have Ibn Ishaq in their chains of narrators, and his reliability has been questioned. Abu Dawood uh, has reported. A hadith better than the aforesaid one through another chain. It has Abu Rakana uh, divorced his wife Suhaima irrevocably and said, I swear by Allah that I meant it to only be a single utterance of divorce. So the Prophet Sallallahu returned her to him. In this hadith, uh, these ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which differ with regards to their authenticity. Uh, what we do see 
uh, from the a hadith in uh, Sunan Abu Dawood uh, that we can learn immense fawa'id from these uh, ahadith, regardless, especially the one uh, the the uh, that were related in Abu Dawood, and it affirms what we have been studying thus far in some of the other authentic uh, ahadith, and that is first about the hukum or ruling in general of pronouncing divorce more than once in one sitting, uh, meaning to uh, pronounce three times or twice or whatever the case to di to divorce one's wife and a lot of times this may be the result of anger or uh, and usually this is the case that they're so upset that the person says anything says you know I, you're divorced you're divorced you're divorced yes I mean it like this you know out of uh, anger and out of sometimes pride whatever the cases may be and emotion and this happens uh, as we all uh, make sin and make mistakes. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Kulu ibn Adam khatta wa khayran khata'ina tawabun. All the children of Adam make mistakes. And the best of those who sin or make mistakes are those who repent. So what we learn from this hadith is uh, one of the benefits uh, that we learn from this hadith is that if a mufti, the one who is going to make a fatwa about or a judgment with regards to these issues of talaq or some issue of ilm or knowledge based issue, that uh, it is not an obligation upon that mufti necessarily to ask for more uh, details, especially if the issue is clear. So meaning, if a, a scholar is going to make a fat, fatwa about some particular issue in another country or an individual in another country, that sometimes it may require that there is more, uh, more evidence or more information provided to the scholar in order to make a more accurate ruling. And this falls under the principle al hukum al that a part of making a ruling on something is correct understanding uh, of, of the situation around it. And so this hadith, it illustrates that if a one making this fatwa or this judgment, if they have knowledge about the issue uh, and if the issue uh, may uh, require more detail, it is not an obligation upon him to uh, seek out more details. And this hadith illustrates for that. Because the Prophet وسلم, in this situation, he just commanded uh, him, uh, Abu, uh, Abu Rukana, to uh, take his wife back. He didn't need to know further details because the hukum was very clear and what the general picture of what had happened. So this hadith illustrates that. Another benefit of this hadith is that this affirms for us what uh, some of the prior hadith that we, we just studied affirmed for us that uh, the divorce, uh, being, uh, divorcing three times is considered only a single divorce, meaning uh, in one city. Uh, and if this was the first one, the first divorce, then in this situation, then it is for the man, he uh, has the ability to return to his wife. It is not uh, an irrevocable divorce. As Abu Rakana uh, had the impression that this was the case. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us that it is permissible for the one who needs further clarity regarding a ruling uh, or a fatwa that was given to them for them to go back and get further clarification so that the affair is completely clear. So that means no one is above 
uh, reproach in that they just give a fatwa and that's the end of the story. Instead, if the person needs further clarification, then they have the right to go back and seek that clarification. Another benefit of this hadith that this hadith uh, illustrates for us is it also illustrates for us that a single, uh, that the pronouncement uh, three times of uh, talaq in one sitting, that it does happen. So this is further dalil, further evidence to show that that divorce does uh, take place, but it is counted as one, as we uh, already mentioned. In the uh, in the next hadith, narrated Abu Huraira, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are three things which whether undertaken seriously or in jest are treated as serious. Marriage, divorce, taking back a wife after divorce, which is not final. Uh, reported by Al-Arba, except the Nisa'i, Al-Hakam graded it as Sahih or authentic. Uh, in an, a narration of Ibn, Ibn Adi, uh, through another chain of narrators, which is da'if or weak, it has divorce, emancipation, and marriage. Uh, Al-Hadith Ibn Abu Usama reported from the hadith of Ubaida Ibn Samit or Ubada Ibn Samit ta'an, tracing it to the Prophet sallallahu it is not permissible to play in three things divorce, marriage, and emancipation. Therefore, whoever pronounces either of them, they certainly become binding its chain of narrators is Baif, is uh, weak. In this uh, group of Ahadith, uh, we learn that <clears throat> that uh, the generality of playing with these very important matters that in fact these are very serious issues and it is impermissible, muharram, to play with these issues. As the Prophet ﷺ made strong in Qar of uh, Abu Rakan or, or the hadith prior to that uh, about uh, playing with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the, the one who's making divorce, uh, pronouncing divorce you know, uh, three times in one sitting, that it's if they're playing with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu was present. So letting us know the seriousness of the issues and affairs of marriage and divorce. And these hadith, they illustrate, although they differ with their authenticity, uh, as we, we mentioned from a hadith prior to this, that these affairs are very serious, and that they are not to be joked about because joking does not excuse the fact that the hukum still takes place. Meaning that you can end up divorcing your wife by just joking about it. And so that these affairs are very serious. Uh, from the main benefits of these uh, ahadith is it shows us... Uh, for example, we learn from these hadith that by joking in general with regards to making agreements and so forth, that it does not, uh, the agreement does not take place. Except in these three affairs that are mentioned in this hadith, and they are marriage, divorce, uh, and returning a wife back. So in these three affairs, then. Uh, these, uh, even joking, is counted and is, is serious. But for example, if a person were going to buy and, and make some sort of business contract with someone and they did it jokingly, they made a joke, then this, uh, you know, and there was a joke on the part of one of the parties or both of the parties, then this act does not uh, take place. 
uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us also the excellent way in which the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, uh, you know, was a teacher, was the best of teachers, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in that he mentioned things in order for people to, to make it easy for people to memorize his hadith, to make it easily for people to, to, uh, to, to keep that in their mind, the hukum about certain things. So in, in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned, uh, three, uh, you know, in three affairs, okay? And in many ahadith, the Prophet sallallahu mentioned like three people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not speak to them on the day of judgment. Or in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, four people, it is not permissible for them such and such. Or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi mentioned seven people on the day uh, when there will be no shade, Allah will shade them. So there are many ahadith where the Prophet sallallahu mentioned and some of them Specifically, those numbers were uh, there, perhaps for the for the uh, to be taken seriously as those particular cases. In some of the ahadith, they are mentioned in order to uh, know that maybe these are the three most serious to make it easy for his ummah to. Uh, to memorize. And you find that the asloob of the scholars also they uh, would follow this pattern as well as uh, and it's called a taqrib, you know, to like almost an estimation or not an estimation, but to say what is close. Uh, you meaning that it's not the exact, but this number is there in order to let you know the seriousness of these numbers. And for example, you find there are several books written about the major sins. Imam al Zahabi's Kaba'ir, Kitab al Kaba'ir being one of the most well known ones. And he mentions so many Kaba'ir in there that does not mean that those are the only Kaba'ir. That does not exhaust the list of Kaba'ir. The scholars also mention in their books about the Ahkam al Ridda, the, the rulings pertaining to uh, people who have apostated in the religion, that they've left the religion, meaning the ways people leave the religion, the ways that necessitate apostasy. And that means, you know, some scholars may count 50, some may count 350. So meaning that, you know, these numbers are just letting you know uh, to give you an approximate value to let you know the seriousness of the ones that are mentioned. So we learn this from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this hadith is one of the ways in which that is illustrated. A another benefit of this hadith is it shows that these three affairs, nikah, uh, marriage, talaq, divorce, and raja, uh, you know, taking uh, a wife back, you know, after, uh, during her idda, that these things happen regardless of whether a person is serious or whether they are joking. So we learn that from this hadith, from this group of ahadith, and showing us the seriousness of this uh, of this affairs, and that these affairs should not be played with by any means, and that it is very serious and can be have major implications even upon one's family. In the 921st hadith narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah the Most High has forgiven my followers what they contemplate on within themselves as long as they do not act upon or speak about them. Mutafakun alayhi. In this hadith, <coughs> in Bukhari and Muslim, and this hadith uh, is a hadith which speaks about hadith and nafs. Hadith and nafs. And this is when a person has certain thoughts. Uh, perhaps it's, it's a waswas, -was, it's a whispering 
of the shaitan about some issue that could be related to their religion and causing doubt. And this hadith of nafs, as we learn from this hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that it doesn't have a hukum unless, of course, you speak or you act upon those whisperings. And those whisperings, in general, they can come related to issues in, in Aqidah, meaning creed, uh, related to Tawheed, related to Allah Azza wa Jal, negative thoughts that are just strange thoughts that pass through the mind of a human being. This is the frailty of a human being. But as long as you don't speak or act upon those whispers, then there is no sin upon you. The relevance of this hadith being in this chapter, because we're in, of course, the book of marriage, and we're discussing, uh, you know, the issues of, of talaq, divorce, and with that being the case, what is the relevance with hadith and nafs? We have to ask ourselves, what is the relevance of hadith and nafs? of a hadith that speaks about hadith and nafs, you know, speaking uh, uh, subconscious thought or self-conscious thought or, or what have you. The relevance has to do with uh, the uh, of this hadith being in the, in the hadith, uh, amongst the hadith in the chapter of talaq, because hadith of nafs, uh, sometimes it's just hadith of nafs, in which causes a person to think about the issue of divorce. So then it has relevance in this chapter for that reason, in that letting us know that if someone thinks about divorce, perhaps they're anger, angry with their spouse. Perhaps the, the, the spouse, there's, there's uh, discord, there's disharmony, or there's some fighting or some conflict or just an argument, and... The, in the back of their mind, this thought comes to them. Not that it's something that they intend, not that it's something that they want to do at all or act upon, but it's just something that passes through their mind because this is the, comp the complexity of the human mind. And so that's why we have this hadith and nafs. Likewise, the whisperings, the waswas of the shaitan. And neither of those have a hukum and affect uh, the marital relationship as far as uh, divorce and talaq or uh, no, in, 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 in ending the marital bond. So in this hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala there are uh, immense benefits and amongst those benefits is that we learn that even if uh, a person has this thought often, that regardless of whether this is something that is uh, a thought that passes through one's mind, or it is something which is often, the hukum is the same in that there is no talaq. It does not mean divorce. This is something that the shaitan, or the uh, due to the complexities of the mind, uh, that these types of whisperings and odd thoughts, strange thoughts, uh, happen due to this. So this waswas has no effect on uh, the hukum. And this is because the Prophet ﷺ said, Malam ta'mil o takallam. As long as you do not act, meaning act upon that waswas, that whispering, or tekellem, speak, as long as you don't speak about it. So you don't, uh, from your tongue, say, you know, I want divorce. You know, it comes to your mind and you shoot it out of your mouth. Or you 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 act upon it. And, and this it can be in many of the uh, aspects of the religion, as we mentioned. It can be everything from Tawheed and Creed to other than that. Uh, also related to this hadith,
is we find and we see that many people are afflicted by this waswas. Many people are afflicted by these whisperings, whisperings of the shaitan, whispers, these et internal uh, whisperings. And so that's why it's very important for us to understand this hadith and benefit from this hadith to let us know that it does not have an effect on your ibadah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ gave us a medicine for that by, uh, you know, reading the Mo'idatan, the, you know, the Quls, Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, and Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falaq, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas, all kind of ways of dealing with this waswas or if it is an act of kufr, amin to billahi wa rasuli. I believe in Allah and I believe in his messenger. You know, to, you know so the Prophet ﷺ gave us uh, pro, uh, prophetic medicines in order to deal with this, uh, this waswas. Related to this hadith, some of the fawaid or benefits of this hadith, the first benefit being it shows us the na'mah the great na'mah, the great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has bestowed upon his ummah in that not holding them accountable for this waswas. And it shows us the perfection of Islam. That Islam does not hold you to accountable that which you have no control over. For example, this waswas, these whisperings of the shaitan. They're obviously, they're whispers, they're external, they're internal, but they're also, they're out of your control. So, from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He allows this. And from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not hold us accountable for that. This is our nature, our fitrah that He subhanahu wa ta'ala created. And... Another benefit of this hadith is that it shows us that no matter how serious this waswas or this hadith and nafs is, uh, for example, as we mentioned, dealing with issues of tawheed and the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that a person is not held responsible for that. As long as they uh, do not persist in this and this is not a true part of their belief. And so that's very important for the person who's afflicted with waswas, especially with regards to Aqidah and Creed, is that they affirm, they know whether they believe or not. They know if they're a hypocrite or not. And that the hypocrites, they don't believe internally. And they manifest Islam outwardly. And a lot of people, because of the waswas, they're tested by this, this, these uh, whisperings of the shaitan. They believe that in turn that they are hypocrites, or that they are have left the fold of Islam, and this is a mistake, and they should not hold themselves liable like this, but rather do not utter those things, do not believe those things when it comes to aqidah. Do not let the shaitan, the shaitan's going to whisper. Strange thoughts are going to come to your mind about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about his lordship, about the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the qadr, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all kind of issues in aqidah that will come, but do not submit yourself to those whimsical thoughts. And that's how you defeat the shaitan. And follow it up with acts of iman and ibadah. And so if this is the case uh, with issues like uh, tawheed, then of course this had and, and a person is not held responsible, meaning if they, they have these whisperings, <clears throat> then what about the one that of course that has this whispering of divorce and, and so forth? This, this, of course, uh, this does not, uh, there's no hukum tied to that meaning that they, it has no effect on the person's marriage. This is not divorce. And very important, when those uh, things happen, then say, A'udhu billahi minashaitani minashaitani rajim. I seek refuge in Allah from the accursed 
Shaitan. Seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this waswas. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the point of reference we want to be concerned with uh, is when we make a statement when it comes to this waswas, when it comes to this hadith and nefs. That when you have this these ill thoughts, for example, the thought of divorce or some other wicked thought, do not speak about it. Do not articulate it. Do not pronounce the divorce. Do not ask for the khula. Do not, uh, uh, you know, speak with this uh, these uh, a, a thought of kufr, of disbelief. And the way we learn that this is one of the criterion for it then becoming a sinful act or perhaps an act which becomes, uh, has a hukum tied to it, is we know this because the Prophet ﷺ said, O takallam, or speak, meaning that the person who speaks, that then they are now accountable because they spoke about this evil thought. They spoke about it. Not in, and this is one thing we want to distinguish, and this is not in the case of someone who's asking maybe for advice, but they're not uttering, they're not saying that this is something that they believe or something like this, but they're asking for advice. What do you think about, I, I should do about this? Or asking a scholar or a person of knowledge, uh, you know, I had this such and such thought in my mind, you know, asking for a hukum. No, this is not, this is, when they speak about it in this uh, way, this does not mean that now the person is divorced or now that they have done an act of kufr, but rather they are asking a hukum and they're giving a wasf, they're giving a description of that hadith of hadith and nefs. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the other criterion for being held accountable for the hadith and nefs is that when a person they act upon it so the person makes an action then they uh, then they're held accountable and this is because of the statement of the Prophet والسلام, when he said in the hadith he said and Allah tajawaz an ummati ma haddathat bihi anfusahu anfusaha and the shahid or the point of uh, that I want to mention in this hadith, which illustrates this hukum, uh, this and this benefit, is that the Prophet sallallahu when he said, "Malam ta'mil," as long as they do not act, meaning act upon that waswas, act upon those whisperings of the shaitan. So in that case, meaning the opposite of that, if they act upon it then now they're held accountable. So the person who then actualizes that uh, 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 act of disobedience, that sinfulness, they thought about zina. Now they actually action, make action and, and commit zina or strive to commit zina. Then now they're held responsible for that. But the one, the shaitan whispered to them and they uh, a, a sinful thought came in their mind, but they didn't act upon it, they're not held accountable. And... So, and we already talked about how this is relevant to talaq, divorce. Another benefit of this hadith is that whenever, when we hear al-qawl bin amal that when, 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 uh, when there is uh, the term qul or amal are mentioned and they're mentioned uh, separately that when we hear qul meaning uh, to make a statement or saying that that includes uh, that or or uh, when we make a, a statement and we talk about amal, 
that amal includes the statement. That means that, for example, in a hadith, uh, if we hear a hadith and or uh, an ayat and it, it mentions about doing amal, doing good deeds or doing a deed, that statements are included in it unless they're mentioned separately or unless they're mentioned together. Okay? Unless they're mentioned together. Bec and this is because statements are actions of the tongue. Statements are actions of the tongue. So when we, when, as I'm speaking to you now, I'm uttering speech. My tongue is moving. Without a tongue, I wouldn't be able to articulate anything to you. So the, the, uh, so statements are a part, or, or, or uh, statements and speaking is a part, is included as a type of amal, as a type of deed, okay? And so that's very important, and that's why the ulama, they mention when they talk about iman, for example, and they say iman is comprised of three parts or three components. Uh, and they mention, for example, al-qawl uh, bilisan, you know, statement of the tongue, wa'amal bil-jawarih, and deeds of the limbs, you know, doing actions, and and al amal bil qalb, and actions of the heart. So all of those uh, parts, those components of iman, in fact, have a in in from one perspective, they are inclusive of actions, and that's why some of the ulama they describe. Al Qum bi lisan, statement of the tongue, okay, utterance, and this is as we mentioned, the movement of the tongue. Wal amal bi jawarih, you know, actions of the limbs. Wa amal bil qalb, that the heart, we don't think of our heart usually as doing deeds. But when we talk about, for example, those internal acts of worship, like tawassal or tawakkal, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, having. Khauf uh, min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa raja, wa hope, and khauf and fear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are actions of the heart. They are actions of the heart, that you're putting your heart into these acts of ibadah. It's not something physical, physically tangible, but they are actually an action. They describe it, the scholars they mention, that it's actually an action of the heart. So this, also this hadith shows us that, uh, this uh, affirms for us that, uh, that point. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.